good morning, everyone. My name is Mina Bose. I'm the Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Programs and the Director for the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency at Hofstra. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here today for our, uh, the panel advocating from change, for change from the outside in the Public Policy and Public Service Programs State and Local Politics Lecture Series. I get the distinct pr pleasure of giving the welcome and then sitting down to enjoy the event. Um, I would be remiss if I did not give a few thanks at the outset. And just to tell you very quickly, the Public Policy and Public Pol Service Program, PPPS, for those of you in the know, um, started the State and Politics Lecture Series two years ago to bring in voices, elected officials, community organizers, think tank experts, educators who study state and local politics. And in New York State, interestingly, and of course following Super Tuesday, we tend to focus a lot on national politics, but the statement that all politics is local, um, I think actually in many ways the election results yesterday illustrate that. That's not our specific focus today, but I think as we look at elections and governance, we see how much grassroots change matters and makes a difference. And so we started this program two years ago. We brought in elected officials from the New York State Legislature, from Long Island, have brought in from the League of Women Voters, and today we have three highly distinguished speakers who have so generously given of their time to share with us their work and how they make a change in public policy. I will give, uh, turn the floor over to my colleague, uh, Phil Dalton, in a moment for the formal introductions. But let me just uh, give a very, very quick thanks. That really, the time does not justify here. Athleen Collins, before she slips away, um, for supporting the series from the outset, along with Melissa Connolly from University of Relations. The entire cultural center staff who really are responsible for everything, all the setup we have here, and our event management staff. Special thanks to Carol Mallison and Amy Trotta for very patiently uh, organizing and reorganizing the setup. Um, this event <laughs> would not be here without the work of Professor Phil Dalton in the Department of Writing Studies and Rhetoric. Um, Phil is someone I've worked with for many years on a number of different events. He's a member of the Calico Center for the Study of the Presidency Faculty Advisory Council. And this semester, I've had the pleasure of working with him on an event for both the Calico Center and now the PPPS State and Local Politics Lecture Series. We are greatly indebted to him and the uh, Department of Writing Studies and Rhetoric, particularly the Rhetoric and Public Advocacy Program. So with that, I'm actually going to turn the floor over to Professor Dalton, and let me just please uh, thank all of you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Phil. I'll turn it over. Thank you, Dr. Bose. Um, as you now know, my name is Phil Dalton. Um, I teach in the Rhetoric and Public Advocacy Program, and I am also the director of our political communication concentration. I've been in, involved in politics in one form or another since I was 15. Uh, I grew up outside of Chicago. I decided I wanted to become a precinct captain. They had to get some like exemption for it, and they got it, and I was made one. Um, I was in the southwest burbs of Chicago, and that experience led me to study political communication once I got to college. And after I earned my degree and finally got tenure here at Hofstra, I decided to poke around in uh, the local political arena. And uh, as I did, um, I made multiple calls. Uh, I showed up at offices. And I kept being told, yes, we, we want you. You're interested. Uh, and by the time I got involved, it took me 18 months to be seated uh, with people who, who mattered. Um, and I thought something was broken here. And, I, and then as a scholar, I thought, well, that, that's fascinating. Uh, people want to get involved in politics, and it's that difficult to, to break in. Um, after the 2016 election, I reached out to my party again, was told they were holding organizing events for new interested people. These events were like a series of classes. And they were well intended, and they, f they were filled with information about local civics. But they were about as dry and as uninteresting as you could possibly imagine. Um, 
I actually apologized to my son for taking him to one of them. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I'd attended the third event, a room that was once full with, filled with 40 people was down to a small handful. And I only recently learned that they took over 100 people who expressed interest and they incorporated fewer than 10 of them into the party. Uh, and it was, it was discussed at that time as a success because they framed it as we weeded out the people who weren't really interested. So if a 45-year-old white male with a PhD has this much trouble accessing local politics, what are the challenges faced by people with, uh, who are less privileged than myself? Once involved with the party, I began paying more attention to the politically active people around me, especially the people who seemed to attract those who'd been left abandoned and under, uninspired by the parties. Facebook groups uh, seem to be an important part of that. Uh, Pantsuit Nation, you might recall, grew up turned into Atlee or Action Together Long Island, Long Island progressives, Long Island activists. Each of these groups has more than a thousand followers. I first learned about uh, Shoshana Hershkowitz uh, through some of these pages. Uh, Ms. Hershkowitz started Long Island Progressive Facebook group where she actively promotes and employs proven forms of activism, including canvassing, letter writing, organizing, and protesting. And some people active in these forums uh, were combative. So uh, I know some of them. They're, I guess, who would be uh, categorized as Bernie bros, <laughs> while others seem more constructive, willing to work with the system. And there's multiple ways of, of operating and being successful that I, I, I hope that in putting this together, we can learn more about. It's, it's more nuanced than either opposing or working with. Um, just last year, I, I looked up to find Shoshana Hershkowitz sharing the dais with Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone at his campaign kickoff event, praising her for her advocacy in the area of election reform. So here was a person who uh, I'm assuming, I, I know a little bit, uh, sort of disappointed with the outcome of the 2016 election, uh, got involved, got, a, got involved from the ground, ground up, grassroots, and before you know it, she's sharing, sharing the stage with the county executive. So I approached her about today's event and she recommended two other powerful Long Island activists who we share the stage with today. These three people have found ways to be effective working outside the system. They're not themselves politicians. Instead, they organize, coordinate, educate, and activate, uh, advocate. Now, the panels that I've worked on here at Hofstra, this is the one I've been most excited about. I think it's the one that students stand to gain the most from uh, in terms of practical knowledge about how to um, in complex ways address the system in order to change it. So allow me to introduce my guests. I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Hershkowitz. She's a choral director at Stony Brook University where she also teaches now, of course, in activism. She's an adjunct professor at SUNY Potsdam, uh, Suffolk Youth Choral Director at Metropolitan Youth Orchestra of New York. She runs Suffolk Progressive's Facebook group with a membership of over 2,000 people and encourages members to organize, walk, do the shoe leather work, the retail work of politics. And among other things, she advocates for labor and voting rights. Minerva Perez, on the, the left, is the executive director of OLA of Eastern Long Island. It's a nonprofit agency committed to promoting social, economic, cultural, and educational development within Long Island's East End Latino and Hispanic communities. She recently recognized as the Sag Harbor person of the year, uh, conducts workshops to help Latinos, uh, Latino immigrants develop workplace skills, um, and has been of late voicing opposition to anti-immigrant immigrant legislation, including uh, support for the Greenlight Law. And uh, I, I pulled a plum quote from her, I had no background in this sort of thing, but the lesson over and over again has been basically, don't wait for someone to give you permission to do the thing you know you're called to do. And in the middle is uh, Shaniqua Levin. She is the campaign director for Every Child Matters on Long Island, a group that encourages people to communicate with lawmakers about children's issues. She's the founder of the Women's Diversity Network. She's the founder of the Long Island chapter of Mocha Moms. She's a founding member of the South Huntington Mother Center. Uh, Ms. Levin's efforts are devoted to advocating in areas of health equity, gender violence, racial bias, and systemic racism. And recently, she has advocated for police justice, representing teachers of color in Long Island schools, and bail reform. So 
I don't feel like I have that much to share. Uh, there, I'm, I'm just, I want to give my, the, the time over to our speakers. So what I'll do is retreat to uh, my seat here and ask uh, Shoshana if you wouldn't begin. And sure. then, and then uh, we'll... Do you want me there or here? Wherever you'd like to be. <laughs> About we can. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Shoshana Hershkowitz, and as Phil said, my background is not politics. I went to school for music education. I spent my first 10 years of my career as a high school music teacher out in Suffolk County, and I'm still very much an educator and musician, but I have always felt really strongly about civic engagement. I was not born here. My family came here from Israel when I was a child and I watched my parents get their citizenship and civic engagement was always a part of our family life. I think that in American life, we're sort of hesitant to talk about religion or politics at the dinner table. And that's all we talked about in my house um, in Hebrew and in English. So I grew up understanding that the work of citizenship was just what we do. And I was always a pretty good voter on the sidelines, but the thing that inspired me to get involved was Barack Obama in 2008. And that was my first involvement in politics. I was here for his debate somewhere out there. I didn't manage to get in, but um, that was my first time knocking on doors. I went to Pennsylvania and did voter registration. I was in calling swing states. I went all in and um, we did it, it was me. Um, <laughs> but um, I think the greatest mistake I made was thinking that the work was done then. And I found out um, I had, my daughter was born nine months later, I'm sure that was not coincidental, uh, after Barack Obama's election. And by the time the next election around, ran, came around, I had a three-year-old and a newborn. So politics kind of took a back seat. I was a good voter. I was more informed than involved. And um, 2016 happened. And I think that what kind of brought me back was the rhetoric of Barack Obama inspired me to come in and start doing the work. And the rhetoric of Donald Trump inspired me to come back because I was afraid. And I wasn't necessarily just afraid for me because I think I'm relatively privileged and fortunate. But I thought about my Muslim neighbors. Uh, I thought about my friends of color. I thought about my immigrant friends. And I realized that this was reminiscent of what happened to my family 80 years ago in Eastern Europe. And I always thought about coming from a family that my grandfather was one of eight from Poland. And he was one of three that were left alive at the end of World War II. And I always thought about who would I have been in that moment. And I felt like when 2016 rolled around, this was my time to figure that out. And that was why I stepped back into this arena. And I started to really learn not just about the national stuff. It started, you know, my, my, my way back in was national politics. But then I very quickly realized that the reason we got to 2016 was because we stopped paying attention right where we live. We lost that sense of civic engagement in our towns, in our county, in our state. And I decided to get involved in that way. I ran my councilwoman's reelection campaign. She's the lone Democrat and the first African-American woman elected in the town that I live in, in the town of Brookhaven, and decided that I needed to figure out how it worked right where I live because if we went from a grassroots perspective, we can build it from the bottom up because the mistake I made, like I said, was thinking we fixed it when we elected Barack Obama. That was only the beginning of the work. And part of what I noticed in the years that I had been between Barack Obama's election and Donald Trump's election, I'd had two kids, I was home with them, I spent a lot of time on social media and I realized that that's where a lot of people were at. That's where people were having these discussions and that I was good at mitigating that. So I started my own group and mostly I started it because I had little kids at home and I thought, okay, how can I make a difference in this process while being a mom of two young kids? Because people like me weren't showing up because the process, the, the committee process, the Democratic Party wasn't exactly making it easy for us to show up and be there when you don't have childcare, when it's at weird hours, when you know it's bedtime for your seven-year-old and that's when the town meeting is. It's not always easy for people who care to get involved. 
So I started my group in the hopes of, you know, finding all the other 40-something moms of young kids for us to find ways to get engaged. So we started with like, okay, let's make sure we're calling our members of Congress. Let's write letters to the editors. Let's show up to our member of Congress's office and fight for saving the Affordable Care Act. And it just started in these small steps. And I think that the beauty of social media is that as I was learning this engagement, I got to document it and share it with the people who were in this group with me and say like, okay, this is new for me too and I'm scared, but we're gonna figure it out, we're gonna do it together. And I think that my background in education and um, my love of Facebook, those two things together sort of made for a good combination where I saw my page, my group, Suffolk Progressives, not as a, we're on one side of the issue, but this is how we get in. This is the entry point. And the hope is that, you know, you watch someone do it, you see the pictures, you see this happen, and then maybe you'll come with me next time. Maybe you'll knock a door. Maybe we'll do this together. And we'll take this Facebook group off of Facebook and into the arena where our voices have been missing for a very long time. The other thing that I've learned in the process is that the best organizers don't always lead. I think that when it comes to issues like immigration and bail reform, Shaniqua and Minerva are my best teachers. And I follow their lead and I say, what should I do? How can I help? Because the truth is, I, no one's got all of the answers. No one is an expert on every topic. And I think that both Shaniqua and Minerva have been in the fight longer than I have simply because their communities were affected in ways that I wasn't. And I had to learn that I wasn't the expert and I just had to listen. And I think that that has been the most humbling lesson of the last four years is realizing how much I didn't know. Learning it, trying to help others learning it, and really sitting back and saying, how can I help as opposed to how can I lead? And I think that that is the way grassroots organizing works. It works from the bottom up. It works from a place of willingness to learn and be humble and not be the expert who has the answer to everything. So that has been my journey. And I want to turn it over to Shaniqua because, um, and to Minerva because, like I said, no one have, these two women have been better teachers than anyone else I've met. So over the summer, I wrote a book, and it's called Poverty's Phoenix. And I wrote this book because I grew up right here on Long Island, and a lot of people that aren't from Long Island just see Long Island as this rich place. Everyone thinks we all live in the Hamptons and big mansions, right? They don't realize that there's two sides to Long Island, and what goes on here for some of us is real life, just like some inner cities. Um, the book I wrote talks about my childhood journey of surviving childhood poverty. I grew up in the Gold Coast of Glen Cove, you know, right on the North Shore, right where there's mansions and also a housing projects. I grew up across the street from the housing projects. My mother was 16 when she had me, and my mother spent a lot of her life being addicted to crack. My father was addicted to heroin and in and out of jail my whole life. So with those odds, I should have continued to be a stereotype. There's things, and according to the stats, that I should have failed at. I sat back and I, had to, I went to Hofstra University and had to leave because I found myself you know, um, pregnant. So I had to leave and I remember my professor saying, if you leave, you'll never come back, don't leave. I was like, oh no, I'm coming back. But he was right, I didn't come back. So I found myself being a mom now, a young mom and realizing that, oh shit, I'm becoming a stereotype. They say parents of teen moms tend to become teen um, moms themselves. Pa children of 
um, parents with addictions tend to become addicted themselves. As I start realizing that I was on the trajectory to become what my mom instilled in me not to, I decided to take a stand, to take a stand and to break these generational cycles of poverty because my grandmother was an alcoholic and she had her family living in poverty. My mother was like one of the poorest of her siblings. So what was next? I was doomed. I didn't want to be doomed. And being the oldest grandchild, I wanted to set a new path for my cousins to show them that there's other ways than what we see in our community. You know, for a long time, I didn't see black families and Latino families with dads in the home. That's not what I saw. We didn't, back in the 80s where it was, you know, a war on my people for doing drugs. Um, now there's beautiful things and I'm happy that it's happened like Narcan and we're saving people. But when the 80s were here and my people was getting heart hit by the drug epidemic, it was locked them up. It was a war on drugs. It was a war on my people. And I didn't see these these homes. I didn't see people owning their own homes. I didn't see people having jobs that really was able to sustain their family and have their families thrive. We were all struggling. I didn't want to continue that. So I decided to take a stand and to be that role model for my family, to show my kids that we were not going to live in poverty. We were not going to become a statistic. We were not going to be a family struggling with addictions. And I took that on my shoulders to be that face for my family, to be that face eventually for the community. So here I am now, married, in my 20s, um, a stay-at-home mom, and not married to my son's father, but now I'm in a new relationship, and I'm married, and we have a child, and I find myself being a stay-at-home mom. And I still hadn't had a full awakening for my community needing my voice. I had it more so for my family. And I'm in this center. My husband's like, you got to get out. <laughs> You <laughs> like go. I, there's programs at the library. Go like go join something. Go find your community. So I go to the library and I'm saved by this program called the Mother Center. And we would come and we would share things about parenting and just our day to day. And it was so amazing. But I found myself being the only person of color and the youngest, the youngest parent with the oldest child. <laughs> So at the end of the series, the facilitator's like, I'm leaving. Um, it's time for someone from the group to be the liaison to help orchestrate this group. Right away, I'm like raising my hand. And she kind of acknowledges me, and then I don't hear anything from her. And then the next week, we're back again. And I'm like thinking that maybe she's going to talk to me today. And again, she announces it. So I'm like, well, maybe someone else said that they were interested. And I'm looking around. No one's raising their hand. Um, after we're the group, everyone would go into little circles and start talking. And they really wouldn't come over and start talking to me. They would talk amongst themselves. And again, I like, well, maybe because I'm black or because I'm the youngest person. I don't know. Um, but she didn't. I said again in that meeting that I wanted to do it. So this is the second time that I'm saying I want to step up. And again, she acknowledges me, but nothing after that. No follow-up. And now we're at her final meeting, and she says it again. So now I'm like, oh, so it is because I'm black. There's no way it's not, right? And so from that moment on, I knew I had to be a voice for my community as well, not just in my family. So I went over to her and I'm like, I said three times that I'd be interested in doing it. So at this point, you know, she's leaving, she has no choice but to give it to me. I made sure that I was gonna show their asses. <laughs> I was made that mother center, the best mother center in the whole organization. Right? I stepped up. I became the model mother center for the whole organization. I did so well that they hired me to charter new mother centers. Right? And it's predominantly middle-aged white women's group. I made sure that we connected. We had lively conversations. And then after that, I found my voice. Because growing up poor, 
growing up dark skin, growing up with undesired hair at the time. Now, everything, growing up with a big butt, like everything was so undesirable back then, <laughs> but now everybody wants it, right? But I'm still scarred. <laughs> but growing up this way had me having low self-esteem. You know, I remember back in the day, people would make jokes and like, oh, your father, this and that. And I developed this kid. I don't care about that, man. That's just a sperm donor. Because what am I going to say? My father's in and out of jail the whole time. I do feel like crap. So I sometimes, although I stepped up in school to be president of different clubs, I was still very silent. I still, and I can talk, so give me um, a notice when my time's running out. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so um, I realized that I was always very quiet still. I walked around town with my head down. You know, I was this very shy person because I was so insecure. So after finding my voice in this mother center, that was it. I went out and I found that new groups. I said, well, where is it? You know, the mother center for black women. So there was a national organization called Mocha Moms. And there, I was traveling all the way to Queens and I lived in Huntington. So that was an hour commute to make sure I had a community. But then I said, other people on Long Island need this. So I chartered the, mother, the Mocha Moms chapter for Long Island. I joined a board because the Huntington Station Boys and Girls Club, which is now the Richmond Center, needed voices. It needed people advocating for them. These are things that you can do. You don't have to, like Shoshana said, you don't always have to be the main leader, but you can play a supportive role. Don't wait for someone to ask you to do something. You see a need, be that person that does it. It takes one person to make a difference and to make a change. So I stepped up into all of these different leadership roles or joined many activism groups and things. And then I found myself being the director of an organization called Every Child Matters. And I was advocating for children's issues, advocating for food stamps. And if it wasn't for food stamps, I would have gone hungry. Advocating for housing. If it wasn't for public housing, I would have been homeless. Advocating for pro a safety net programs programs that children need that I didn't even know that I needed as a child, but therefore, because they were there, I was able to survive. So find something. Find something to be passionate about and add your voice. Whether it's advocating, whether it's writing letters, whether it's going to speak to your lawmakers about issues that are concerning to you, whether it's emails, phone calls, starting a group, find something because every cause needs your voice. We rely on volunteers heavily to get all of the things we do, um, all the things and policies that we need passed on. I worked on, you know, policies like Razy Age. New York and North Carolina were the only two states still incarcerating 16 and 17 year olds and trying them as adults. I got behind that and did grassroots efforts on Long Island to make sure that bill passed and it has passed. Worked on paid family leave insurance to make sure that we get 12 weeks off no matter if you're a man or a woman and you're introducing a new child into your home or if you're being deployed or if you're adopting. Those are things that need people's voices. We need to go to Albany. We need to meet with our lawmakers in district. All these things need people's voices. Recently and still fighting for bail reform because they want to roll it back and it had, after nine days of it being out they were ready to roll it back without any data. But yet my people are being incarcerated at a higher rate than anybody else and why do you want to keep cash bail because it puts more money in certain people's pockets creates jobs for certain people but it doesn't make an even playing field find something that you're passionate about and add your voice you don't have to be a lawmaker to create change because lawmakers are not always the expert on everything they require you to come to them with the knowledge and a bill that's important so that they can sponsor it sometimes they will come up with their own but a lot of time it's community members like you it's students like you that are saying I care about this and I will vote you in office and take you out if you do not support the things that I am passionate about and that are good for my community be the change maker in your family be the change maker in your school be the change maker in this world it's up to you to make the difference Amen. well 
I am proud to sit at this table. I get to tell you that. <laughs> wow. Um, this is the first time I'm actually getting to meet Shaniqua, so yes. it's wonderful to meet you. And I have a feeling that we'll, we'll be working together and continued work with Shoshana, sure. so thank you. Um, my name is Minerva Perez, and, um, and I'll take it from a sort of a personal uh, starting point and then kind of get up to this moment uh, as quickly as I can. I do tend to talk fast, so I apologize. Um, when I work with law enforcement, they love it. I think it's because they just want me to get through whatever the heck I'm talking about and get out. <laughs> but they're like, no, no, it's fine. Keep going faster. Uh, so um, I grew up in Miami. I was born in Manhattan, but I grew up in Miami. Um, and I grew up in a high school that was kind of a third and a third and a third of African-American, Latino, and white. And, um, and it, you know, didn't always work perfectly, but I, I di you know, didn't realize till later that I was in this kind of really kind of blessed uh, environment where it, it was great. And then I went to school in the city, New York City, for college, and ended up coming out uh, to the east end of Long Island, so the Hamptons, um, Sag Harbor, uh, and um, realizing that I had gone back in time to like 1940, maybe, or something like that. And I looked around, I was like, where are all the people of, of any kind of color? And then, and then I, I was not doing a lot of work with uh, immigrant communities in Miami because, quite honestly, um, I was brought up uh, and a lot of my influences were from very, very strong um, Latinas. They, they just were. My, my father was Puerto Rican, but I didn't grow up with him. He was never in my life. I never even saw a picture of him. My mother was mentally ill. I was raised by my grandparents. So I had this strange sort of upbringing, but it was all love. So that's all that kind of really matters as long as there's love. Um, but uh, in terms of my connection to my Latina roots, it didn't come through my blood, really. It came more through the mentors in my life, and they happened to be all Latina. So they were um, uh, Colombian and Cuban and Chilean. And so um, went to school in the city, came out to, to eastern end of Long Island, and um, started hearing all of this horrible rhetoric from a Democrat, uh, Steve Levy, uh, our, our uh, uh, county executive uh, for Suffolk County, and I was horrified, and I was also kind of looking around and saying, but I know that there are Latinos here somewhere, and I know these, you know, I <laughs> think they're the ones doing most of the work, and yet they're, they're nowhere. It's like, where, where is everybody? And, and yet all this rhetoric was out there. And so I started asking around, who's involved with the, um, the Latino community out here? Um, because I just, I, I just wanted to know who they were. Uh, not necessarily to do any of the work, but I kind of wanted to make sure that someone was doing the work, which is like, yeah, right. Uh, so I kind of found out this organization called OLA, and this woman, Isabel uh, uh, Scanlon, Sepulveda de Scanlon, and met with her, and it was a very tiny little organization, uh, no paid staff at all, and um, they had had one part-time executive director for about six months. Um, and they were doing the best they could, but quite honestly, there was a lot that needed to be done. So I got involved and volunteered and started very quickly speaking out at these um, legislative events, um, speaking out against anti-immigrant bills that were being uh, put out there by, by Steve Levy and being voted on and, and uh, people were voting them to pass. And these were other Democrats that were voting these to go forward. And I just was uh, stunned, stunned and horrified. Uh, I got I ended up becoming sort of the volunteer executive director, which is strange when you've got a full-time job as a, a recruiter, which I was because I had to pay the rent somehow. Um, my background is theater, so this is, this is how it all happens. <laughs> it's all theater. Um, but uh, got involved with them in a part-time, in, in a volunteer capacity, and was doing a lot of these uh, speaking engagements and, and speaking on behalf of our East End community, East End meaning the five East End towns, Riverhead, Southampton, South Hold, and, uh, and Shelter Island. And within that area, because as we get the same stereotype about Long Island being sort of this rich place to be, you're in the Hamptons, nobody wants to talk to you about struggle. They don't want to even hear what you're talking about. And when it comes to you know, what goes on uh, with our African American uh, communities or members of our community, with, uh, also with um, Shinnecock Nation and with immigrant communities, um, documented and undocumented, you know, the, whole, the whole conversation around that is that it's a mixed status family, a mixed status community. You don't peel people apart. There are so oftentimes people will ask me, well, they just want, and they're well-meaning people, so this is the hard part, is because you need to maintain your heart and your love throughout all of this, because even the people that you know want to do the best for you are going to be the ones that fall over and over again. Um, they're going to be the ones that get in your way some of the times, over and over again. You've got to keep your heart open and keep your eye 
your eyes on the prize because you can't let them stop you either. But they'd ask me, well, of this community that you're working with, or of you know, in Long Island or the east end of Long Island, how many Latinos? So I'll you know, I'll maybe quote some old numbers from the census and say, but it's hard to gauge. You can't really gauge by that. Um, and then they'd say, okay, of that percentage, how many of those people are undocumented? Because what they're trying to get me to do is kind of carve out my community, my whole East End community, carve that away as though, okay, let's really focus on what needs to be done. And you know who does that a lot to me? Politicians. They want to know that because they're looking at those votes, which I get it. I get the hard numbers game. I understand it, but I am not going to carve out humanity to serve your purpose because you think that's serving your purpose when it's not. So when I go and I speak in front of, let's say, the different parties, it's mostly been one party that's asked me to speak, um, but when uh, OLA's a nonpartisan organization, so I'm kind of careful, but, uh, but there was one party that I seem to go and talk to uh, often and um, about how to engage the Latino vote. And I will give them just a litany of ways in, ways in to, to, that, to that community, ways into uh, to, to engagement, not just Latino in general, but even youth engagement. And to sit there and kind of watch it over and over again go nowhere is extremely frustrating. But to have those politicians that I know really mean well try to have me carve out sort of the heart and the spleen and the liver of our community so they could say, well, we'll deal with that later. We want to focus on the people that are eligible to vote. Well, guess what? This whole other group of the whole, the spleen and the liver and the heart, they are your vote influencers. And this concept is one that I find is very, very powerful and very important, though not necessarily heated and not necessarily put into some, any kind of actual action. Um, but the vote influencer is the undocumented grandma, the undocumented cousin who's going through a life out here, in, uh, let's say in our community, the east end of Long Island, that is absolutely impacted by what is happening with policy and protocol in some of the most key areas of that person's life. That could be public education, that could be law enforcement, that could be health care, that could be transportation, um, all of these areas. So that person has some direct uh, experience in those areas and that person, you better believe it, is talking to that voter or that eligible person to vote. Um, and saying, hey, listen, this is my life. Even if they're not s explicitly talking about voter engagement or civic engagement, they're talking about their unlivable life in the area called the Hamptons. There are, there are aspects of poverty that are happening in the Hamptons that you wouldn't even believe. A room and a room and a room. Five people in a room. And they're not there because they're, you know, they're living the American dream. At this point, it's not even about the American dream. It's about being trapped with nowhere else to go, and that is the spot that they're at. Um, they m might be on their way to a pathway to citizenship or not. Their kids might be citizens or not, but they are our community members. The other piece that I try to put out there is that our school, we've got uh, 20, about 20 school districts on the east end of Long Island, which is kind of insane. So Western Long Island does it a little bit differently, I believe, and then the city, I think, does it differently. But essentially, on the east end of Long Island, let's just take East Hampton which spans from Montauk all the way to the border of Sag Harbor. Um, th in that area, every single school is its own district, which is a tremendous waste of money. It's a, 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 a danger of miscommunication. It's all kinds of things that aren't good. Um, maybe they wanted it to be this little bubble of perfection. Um, but if, if you've got the opportunity to have a bubble of perfection, then it better be a bubble of perfection. But what we're seeing instead is that we're still advocating for families that are, children are being denied or delayed access to a public, pu public education, which is against, against the law. And something as simple as saying, well, gosh, that's against the law, Minerva. Why don't you go tell someone in, your, in an elected capacity? Why don't you go talk to this person or that person? This has only been four years that I'm doing this as a full-time executive director for this organization. I got to tell you that doesn't work. It doesn't mean that I stop doing it, um, but I have to augment that kind of work by basically including those powers that be for accountability reasons, for documentation reasons, so that I can never forget, so that I can make sure our community never forgets what certain people in power didn't do when they were given all the information, all the information to act. And I don't mean act to be the great big hero, but at least don't be the villain. And when I look at certain po parties and, and the villainy that's, per that's perpetuated by certain parties that I am still a part of, it, it's hard for me to not be crushed. It's hard for me to, to, to get up there in front of youth, we do a lot of work with youth, and say, uh, get out there and do this thing. But that's why this panel interested me the most. This panel, I, I, I wanted to be here because of the conversation about doing something when you're on the outside. It doesn't mean that you give up on those folks that are on the inside, but you work twice as hard 
and you find out strategies that are going to keep engaging, that you don't give up, even when that person in front of you has maybe let you down here, let you down there. You keep listening with new ears because things change. They change for them. They have epiphanies. They have things that happen in their lives that allow them to open up their ear and their heart in a way that maybe they couldn't before. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip real, real quickly to a couple of, of concrete things that we've been involved in. So uh, one, um, in writing legislation, the Peaceful Communities Protection Act is legislation that when I finally wasn't the only person working at the organization, I was able to hire a human rights attorney who uh, had been working for 10 years prosecuting war crimes in Kosovo, worked at The Hague. He is now our full-time general counsel. So to find money for that and to get people behind me on that was huge. We opened up our, one of our, an office in East Hampton Village, which is not an easy place to get a space um, and afford it. So we have that now. Uh, I have a full-time administrative assistant. We do intakes. Um, too much of the time on, on areas like wage theft. Uh, we're doing a lot of work right now advocating for the rights of children of sex crimes, children victim of sex crimes, which I would like to connect with you on, um, in terms of what our local law enforcement is and isn't doing, and the intersection between the DA, Suffolk County DA, and local law enforcement, why children, child victims of sex crimes are just sort of falling through this net. What in the world is going on there? So advocating for that, uh, for strengthening that. Um, also working with local law enforcement, because just as every school is its own district, every town has its own police department. And within that town, there's often a village with, with its own police department. So when you're talking about an, uh, a not yet documented immigrant or a family that has mixed status in that family, navigating what's going on, that entire family is less likely to go to law enforcement for something like um, sexual, sexual abuse, molestation, domestic violence. All these different areas are like they're less likely to go to the school and say, listen, I don't like what's happening with my child in your school. I feel like you're not doing enough for my child with uh, a disability um, or special needs. They're not going to do that because they're so fearful of any system kind of looking at them with, with a kind of under a microscope or looking at them even twice. So all these areas of systems that we have right now what Ola is doing is looking at the systems that we have, not trying to recreate the wheel, but what, what, what's working with the systems, what isn't working, and then being very, very clear and very, very public and um, thoughtful about what we can do to change that and strengthen that system. We're working on a series of FOIL requests that we put out there to law enforcement to kind of look at the possibility of profiling, quite honestly. Um, and then now we're working with Columbia University to help us study um, that data. So we're doing things in a careful enough way so that we do present it and we say, listen, during this period to this period, it is quite clear that you were profiling. And what does that mean right now to you? What does that mean right now to all the people that we were concerned, that we presented this to at the time? Where are you right now with that? And wh how do we move forward with that information uh, in mind? So it's, it's about taking what we're doing and then putting it into systems that, that continue to, to strengthen and, and, and prove lasting change and bringing people on board as we do it. in activism, organizing, and political change um, would, would be able to direct questions to the uh, speakers. Uh, so, but if you do, I've been told, you have to come to the, the mic so that the, the recording system picks it up, because it won't pick it up if you're calling out from your seat. So please come up and speak, but uh, as you make your way and get through the crowd of people coming to the mic, uh, I have a question. Um, we're in the, the heart of this political season and a lot of the focus is on the parties. Um, and I'm curious, from your standpoint, uh, do the parties aid you? Do they, do they work for you? Do they, do they help you accomplish the sorts of things you wish to achieve? I'd like to start only because I think my, my answer is going to be negative, and I would hope that, that there's maybe more positive <laughs> answers that come from uh. these wonderful women. Um, I, I don't give up, um, but at the same time, no. I feel I have felt and feel, and I'm glad it's being recorded, hindered, hindered. Because what I do feel is I feel that the, the work that, that requires bravery, that in the face of certain folks that, that, want, that want to maintain a position or they're, they're strategizing, what ends up happening is you become uh, sort of, it, it almost becomes a little bit of terrorism, I gotta tell you, where it's like, well, hey, vote for me or else that bad guy's gonna show up. Well, guess what? 
you are the bad guy. I'm presenting to you life and death issues that you are not acting upon. And yet you're telling me if I don't vote for you, there's something wrong with that. And that's what's happening right now. Um, they're not really working, I would say, because they're not really looking at community members as leaders. They're handpicking people that they want to give the role to. Um, and that becomes a challenge because who's to say that you all aren't the next leader, but when do you get your turn? You know, when do you get to be featured? How do you even get in the good old boys club? Um, when someone is just picked because an example that I give, oh, well, he's retiring as a firefighter, so we're gonna give him the legislator position. What? Like, how does that even work when you have activists out here really working to create change and to be a voice for the community and our leaders are just making backdoor deals and handpicking people that haven't even fought for the community. So I would say no. Yeah, I'm with them. And it, it makes me really sad. And I think that I, because I come from a relatively privileged background, I'm sorry, just thank you. Um, was the last one at the table to arrive at that conclusion. I mean, I think, the, the phrase that comes to mind, Martin Luther King Jr. kept talking about the white moderate. And I feel like that is the crossroads we're at right now. Like some healthcare for some people is good enough, you know, and fixing some immigration stuff for some people is good enough. And what I have learned over the past few years engaging in communities and listening is that it's not good enough. And I am disappointed that the Democratic Party is the pro party right now of incremental progress as opposed to sweeping structural change that brings everyone along. And I'm a lifelong Democrat, and I will say that. And I, I guess it's a better party than the Republican Party for sure. I think that the principles are right, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm saying all the wrong things right now, but I'm just going to be truthful. I think that Democrats need to do better. And I think that I have learned that it is completely unfair to expect the Latino vote or expect the black vote or expect the youth vote when your policies don't help any of those communities. And again, I have been fortunate enough to be relatively unscathed no matter who is in charge, but I have realized that people like me have to sit at the table and help as opposed to say, oh, well, that's good enough. You know, and I mean, I think that that is the argument I am trying to make to people who look like me right now, that it is not enough to just go check the box that has, you know, the blue team versus the red team, and that anything that leaves young people, that leaves immigrants, that leaves people of color behind is unacceptable. It is not good enough. And I think that that has been my lesson of the past few years, and that is, that is my bone to pick with the Democratic Party. I've, I have no faith in the Republican Party addressing it, but I will work with the Democratic Party when I can, and I will take them to task when they fall short, because it's not fair or just that only the black and Latino communities speak up for the black and Latino communities because it is a communal problem and until we are a real coalition of all of us speaking out for one another, then it's just political theater. This is probably the perfect time for me to hop on the mic. Um, so full disclosure, I am friends with two of the presenters and new friends, hopefully with the third. Um, and I co-founded one of the organizations that um, Joel Dalton mentioned, Long Island Activists. My name is Kimberly Cooley, and I am running a, in this congressional district um, to be a delegate to the national convention where I will be pledged to support Bernie Sanders as our next president. Um, so I hopped up here. I want to piggyback off of um, what you just said um, and ask, I believe, Shoshana, the words you used were disappointed and sad um, when you ladies in your activism arrive at those feelings 
what are things that you do to keep you going and keep you resilient um, and how do you find strength? Who's first? No. For me, I, um, I have to get out and be with the people. Like I'll find myself going to be around other like-minded people and that'll get me going or to a rally or to go and scream up and down the halls of Albany um, because it does feel like sometimes it's draining. Being an activist is draining. Um, but once I surround myself with other fighters, then that fuels me to continue to go. And um, just remembering to where I came from and who's gonna fight for the kids that struggle with the same things that I struggled with growing up. So that constantly motivates me to not give up. Um, <clears throat> I'll echo that. Uh, I, I think it's not even just youth, but a lot of it comes from getting to work with youth in, in our community. But and more specifically, some of the clients that we work with, because um, some of the things that you'll end up, uh, like let's say a young woman, victim of, of sexual assault, and, and the kind of bravery that you, you see coming from a 15-year-old, and a 15-year-old, um, and then the support that she has of her mother, her single mother, um, and, you, and you ask, you know, what, what gave you the strength to do that, and then hearing that 15-year-old um, be, be your future. Um, and, and then the sort of the sickening kind of feeling that, um, that that's what it takes, that, that I, I get to feel good because this young woman who's been through fire is gonna be stronger than half the adults that I work with. So, it gives me strength though because, <clears throat> excuse me, because uh, being out with our community, that's it. Because you know what, they're not giving up. So how in the world am I gonna give up? You know, I'm, of course not. Um, but I think that's the thing to go back to, is just keep, keep going back into the community and then keep sharing that because that's what, um, and, and not, you know, and the other thing that, I, that I, 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 I have to be careful with as well is that I get a little angry when sometimes, you know, the press might want to hear more about this story, that story, and then it becomes almost exploitive, you know, because there's this like feeling of the, the schadenfreude or whatever. What is it called? Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude, yeah. yeah. Of, uh, of basically relishing in someone else's pain or just somehow getting off on it, you know. And so I, I, it's, it's tough because there are these stories, there are these things that you're experiencing and you want to be able to share to move people, but you also get frustrated that what is it that you have to hear? What do I have to depict for you about this child that you then move? And then, and then at a certain point, I say, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna go down that road. I'm just gonna do everything I can to make you move and to move this dial um, to justice. And, um, but it keeps me going, I think, is, is, is the same, kind of a similar concept. Yeah. I think for me, it's two things. One is action, and like Shaniqua said, being with people who are like-minded. I think that um, also remembering that I get, I have the privilege, and I'm trying not to use it, of walking away. You know, I can just shut my door and my family is safe. And, and I have to remember that I have that privilege and remember that I shouldn't use it if I really care about these causes. And I think that the other thing is I'm a musician. I'm, I'm a choral conductor. So art is therapeutic. Art is a place, and working with young people, I teach college kids, I teach high school kids, Working with them reminds me that they have to be engaged and they have to be heard, and I think that art is an incredible way to do that. So I've changed the way I do art. I think that um, someone who really made me think about this was Manuel Oliver, who is the father of Joaquin Oliver, who was killed in Parkland. And he is a painter and a sculptor, and he talks about artivism, this idea of using art to tell a story, to move people. So I know as a choral conductor, when I think about my programming now, you know, we've got our Mozart and our Bach and our Haydn, and they're important, I love my dead guys. But alongside those dead guys, I'm making sure that I am telling the stories of female composers, of people of color, that, you know, on the last concert I programmed, a, se a segment of the oratorio considering Matthew Shepard that tells the story of Matthew Shepard who was, you know, left for dead 20 years ago as an LGBTQ kid in Wyoming. 
and making sure that my students hear these stories and understand that art is such a powerful medium for changing hearts and minds. And I think that, you know, that, that for me, art and activism go hand in hand. And I think that art has always been a reflection of the society we live in. So I've decided to, that, that, that using that as a medium gives me strength because expressing emotions in a healthy way allows me to keep going when I encounter obstacles. Joanny Espinal. Um, I feel very connected to Shaniqua because I don't know if I'm saying name right, but um, I grew up in a very similar upbringing. So I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, and I grew up in the projects. So I've seen a lot of injustices done to my people just because we didn't know our rights or like, systematic racism. We didn't have the best education. Like all odds were like pointed for us to fail. Um, so growing up, I knew that I wanted to be a voice for my community. Um, college is my first step. I'm a first gen. Um, so <laughs> um, I just wanted to know, like, what is your opinions on how, like, um, like a person like my age can start and becoming active in their community? Like, how can I start doing something for my community? Yeah. You can start right here on campus. <laughs> um, there's so many, you know, issues, and thank you for having the courage to speak up and for being an example for your family and being a first generation. I know how hard that is, and sometimes the support isn't there, you know? So just keep, keep in the fight to make sure that you graduate and you stay and you become that, because um, we need more college grads in our situations. Um, I would say, to th what, what is your passion? What causes, like, what are your things that, that get you, like what things or, or bother you, like figure out what that that is. Like maybe it's, you know, it, it is poverty or, or something like that. And then find, uh, you can, you know, post something in school to get a group of people to come together and meet with you to talk about the issues and then identify what action that you all want to take. You know, um, food collections and stuff are all great, but those aren't systemic changes, right? So that's what you want. You want to now go and meet with a lawmaker about the issues or just start off by writing a letter. So to start off having, you know, speaking about the importance of things, creating a petition. A petition's easy enough to go around campus and get people to sign on to something. You can go and find different bills um, that are out for the Senate or the Assembly and get people to sign on to those bills and um, create more knowledge about them so that way people are calling their lawmakers saying, I support these bills. Do you support them? I want you to be a co-signer of these bills. Find the things that are interested to you, that you're interested in and then get other people to support it with you. Even if you don't get other people, do it yourself. Right? Shoshana, I love it. She goes on Facebook and she's calling representatives right on from on Facebook and you hear what she's saying and you hear how easy it is and how not intimidating it is and she's holding them accountable. You can start just phone banking for issues that are a concern to you and those are easy enough. We have our smartphones. You can create a Twitter campaign, an Instagram campaign and at that person and say, you know, will you support this? Create an image. There's um, probably giving you so many ideas that you yeah. won't remember, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll repeat it afterwards too. <laughs> Hi, I'm Imani. I am a student in the School of Public Policy and Rhetoric. And I have two questions. But the first one, going off of um, the last one, you talked about vote influencers and those individuals who might not be eligible to vote but can influence others who are eligible. But a pattern I've been noticing over the course of this election is like the more educated we become, the less we kind of forget why we came to school in the first place to advocate for those communities that we're coming from? Mm -hmm. And in what ways can we prevent that? Because I feel like you fall into a pattern of kind of exploiting our own communities in order to get our peers to care, and I don't want to resort to that. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a terrific challenge. Um, I, I don't think that you have to fall victim to that. I don't think you have to go down that road. I think um, the, the keep, keeping sort of the pure purpose, uh, what 
how to reconnect to that is, is rem remembering your community and then, and then being, having some actual physical contact, get, actually getting in there, um, talking with folks that, that are doing some grassroots stuff right now. It doesn't mean that you might not have the same time to do it because you're dedicating your time to your studies and you've got a lot going on here, but making sure that you've got that line in, that you've got that line in so you don't become sort of like floating up here with these you know, with sort of ideas and, and, uh, and theoreticals uh, when you know on the ground what's going on. Um, I think I think it's it's good to make sure you you have that tie in and you don't and you don't let go of it even when people are saying oh yeah but you know don't spend so much time there do this if you lose sight of that and you lose connection to that that that's exactly what what will happen. And my second question, I'm going to use the school as a scale. So you talked also about keeping people accountable, those in power accountable for their inaction regarding complaints from their constituents. I think there's an issue that's kind of recurring with a lot of student organizers here to um, be very open and loud about what their problems are, but we don't really see change happening. Mm -hmm. So in what ways, on a collegiate scale, could we keep those in power accountable? So you're talking on a college campus. Mm -hmm. The people on the college campus keeping like your college campus people in power or um, politicians? The people okay. who make the decisions okay. regarding changes that students want. Okay. So I think that certainly, I mean, I know on my campus, um, the Student Senate and our unions, I know that like, for example, Stony Brook has a very active graduate student union and they are not afraid to walk into the admin building and occupy the admin building. You know, there's a little bit of like that Occupy Wall Street vibe because like particularly on our campus, um, these the, the fees have been raised time and again on our graduate students who are TAs and they're paying and they're taking basically taking a segment of their paycheck to teach you know and in, in fees so I think that sometimes it is engaging in a polite way and and scheduling a meeting and bringing a group and treating it almost like you know I would treat my member of Congress who I'm not a fan of but um, but I, I've been in that office with a group of people and lobbied for a specific issue. And I've also, yeah, we're gonna treat this like it's my member of Congress. Um, I've also written letters to the editors, so using your student newspaper, writing to Newsday, like making, making it so that people can't ignore it. And I mean, I think that that's an example from the GSEU of like, we're gonna walk into the admin office and we're gonna like pound drums and say, and like march around the admin building. You know, I think that like, lots of different means of pressure. Some of them can be super friendly, you know, like let's sit down in your lovely office behind a closed door, but also making sure that that's not where it ends. And using, using things like your university senate, any u student unions, things like that, mm -hmm. but also using the sphere of public influence, be it newspapers, social media, if you do have a protest, document it, film it, like put it out there, let people see what's going on. I think the more it is public, the less people can hide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey there, uh, I'm Holden. I'm mixed race and a part of the LGBT community. Um, I'm wondering what, so a lot of black LGBT people and a lot of women of color, a lot of mixed race people feel like they don't connect anywhere within either community, either due to racism, due to homophobia, due to sexism, anything like that. My question is, how do we make marginalized communities more intersectional and more unified? It's so hard. Um, I feel your pain. That's one of the reasons why I started the Women's Diversity Network. I was finding through my advocacy that it was either all blacks, all whites, or all Latinos doing stuff, and we were never coming together. Um, you want to intentionally get involved in something or create something yourself where that is your mission, to be diverse, to... Um, center the marginalized voices and let it be known. Don't hide behind it. Say we're focusing on lives that have been marginalized. We're focusing on creating diversity and put it out there. And if you can't find anything that is existing, you got to create it yourself. 
And it's okay to create it yourself. It's okay to start off with one person, two people, three people, and let that be your focus. And then you will attract more people that are looking for the same things because people are. I started this organization just a couple of years ago. I have 30 core, core members and about a thousand people or more that support us. And we, every year, and you're welcome to come and you'll probably find more people there if you come too. April 18th, I invite all of you to come to the diversity summit and at the diversity summit it's a day filled with, and for students it's only $21 if you get a group of people together it's 10 but um, you get trainings trainings on how to be an activist how to create things it's like over 20 different trainings you get to choose from you also will have um, and cultural entertainment that you may have not experienced before and a diverse cultural buffet of food as well all for $21 and it's a full day at SUNY Old Westbury you come there you'll meet other people my co-hosts are made up of LGBTQ, um, LGBTQ plus organizations made up of activist organizations made up of sorority and fraternity or um, sorority organizations not fraternities um, made up of those different organizations and black organizations and Latino organizations because of that because we're always often doing things in our own areas and don't come together to fully make change and with Long Island being always in the top 10 most segregated places in our country by design how else will we make this change if we don't take it on ourselves to do something so look to see what's out there if you don't find it you got to create it Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Savannah Miles. Um, I'm a student here, obviously. Um, so I'm from the Bronx, so similarly situated growing up inside of poverty. I most recently worked for the Bronx Defenders this past summer and another grassroots organization which advocates for these issues such as the poverty to prison pipeline, immigration, school to prison pipeline, so on and so forth. And in that space with similar situated and like-minded people, I don't have to explain what those issues are, but I find myself on this campus sort of coming into conflicts and being targeted for speaking out about these issues when they're mischaracterized by people who don't live the experience and mischaracterize poverty or the poverty to prison pipeline as laziness. Um, I found myself being targeted by public safety, having my room searched, by professors failing classes for speaking out against, um, against stuff that they have said to be false because just because they believe that these policies are effective even though they have been statistically proven to be detrimental towards uh, my community and similar communities as well. So I guess my question is how do you continue to advocate in these spaces, spaces like college where um, people don't have the same, same mind that you do or don't have the same vision and sort of see the policies that you know hurt your community as beneficial because it's benefiting their community directly. So how do you continue to advocate when you're getting failed in classes and you know, you're being targeted for just trying to speak up and be that voice. That's so much to unpack. Just, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry that that's your experience. Just start off there. I mean, I, I, I really, because I'm not working in a university system, uh, as maybe you both are having more experience with that, uh, it's been a long time. Um, I, I do think what I, at least what I've found to be somewhat effective in, in terms of power, when you've got power over you uh, or, and around you and you're stopped by that power, is, uh, is the documentation of everything, um, the, uh, the finding, finding those other folks as well, as Shaniqua was saying, um, that may be experiencing some of these same things, documenting those, really putting things out there, finding out what policies exist to know when people are breaking their own policies. Um, because oftentimes there's sneaky things that go along with that, which is let's not write a policy yet. We're working on the policy, so therefore they've never broken a policy because they haven't written it yet. Um, but it, zeroing into some of those things, like wh how else can you illustrate the fact that these things that are happening to you are happening as a result of the work that you're doing and that, uh, and that maybe it's un not just unfair, maybe it's also illegal. Maybe there's a policy that was broken within the university structure. You know, l learn that, you know, study that and see who else might be affected uh, in, in a similar way so that it's not you alone or you against the machine alone. Um, I think that would be one, one way. I just I want to say that I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry because I think that there is 
so much ignorance because we are so incredibly segregated that like I feel like you know someone like me didn't understand why bail reform was so necessary until I heard Shanique would talk about it and I think that man I'm sorry that you and your story has to sometimes be an example to wake other people up that's a really big burden and it isn't fair and, I, and I'm sorry for that and I and I think part of the reason I feel so emotional about this is I feel like it's the job of people who haven't lived that life to find the empathy to be real allies. And you know, when I talk about disappointment and frustration is when I see good people come up short on those ends. And I, I, I feel like my work is getting better at that and teaching other people to be good at it too. And if I might add, because I, got, I get some of those things, you know, um, online telling me that black people are just lazy and it's black people against black people. That's the problem, you know, and I, I get enraged. I used to, right? And some of the things I learned is I'm not going to change everybody, um, but I'm going to focus on those that are movable and focus on building up the power and the strength of those that do agree with my platform, especially when I know that morally and ethically the platform is right. So if you change your focus and really galvanize those that support you or those that will listen and can become supporters and not worry as much about the naysayers, your pool of people will grow. Those naysayers, we need to know what their message is. Look at them as an education because we need to know what we're fighting up against and the research that we have to do so that way we can come with better arguments. Use them that way while you build up your team of supporters because there's always gonna be people that just have the privilege to not give a damn and don't want to care and just wanna keep going about life and you're interrupting their way of life because now they have to make way for other people. So know that and just use that as fuel to keep pushing. Hi again. Hi. <laughs> um, so my next question, it's regarding the concept of artivism. Is that the word? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a word now, right? <laughs> so um, here at Hofstra, we have like a very lovely rhetorical studies program, um, a lot of classes regarding performance art as a form of advocacy. We also have our speech team. But I feel like when all of these great groups do the work to advocate through art, it's hard to connect with people who are not members of that community, and I think it'd be very beneficial. So as an art educator, what do you think? <laughs> I think some of it is bringing in people who haven't showed up in those spaces before, and I mean, that's true of activism too. If, you know, if you're only preaching to your own bubble, like it, you're, not, you're not growing your network. So I think some of it is that. I think, um, again, part of the reason I've changed my programming is that, like again, as much as I, I love my dead guys, I love my Mozart and my Bach, like the stories of people of color and minorities and the story of Matthew Shepard is going to reach a different community. I know that like when I was talking about the program I was doing, members of my activist community came to my concert. I don't think they would have ever come to a <laughs> choral concert, you know, if I was like, check out this like fantastic Mozart mass that he wrote when he was 12, you know, like, even though it's really good. But I said, hey, I'm doing this piece that, that you know, that comes from the story of Matthew Shepard. And they were like, oh, I'm going to come to your concert. And I was like, you are? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then they brought a few friends. And I think that that was, oh, that some of it is publicizing and reaching out. But I think some of it is telling stories as artists that, impact the community that relate to current events. And I think that that is a really important piece of art alongside honoring, you know, European music, which, you know, I think feeds a lot of what we do, but I think that it's really important as artists that we're not only looking at the Mozart and the Bachs and the Verities that we're performing the music of living composers, of women, of people of color, I mean, I, I'm gonna wax poetic here, but like one of my favorite pieces that I've ever done was um, the text comes from two Facebook posts written by a woman named Maya Jackson after the deaths of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. And she talked about like what that meant to her and then a friend of mine set that to music. And I remember how powerful it was to put that in front of my choir 
which was predominantly white and start to be like, hey, we need to talk about this and we need to talk about it and we need to talk about why black lives matter. And I know that's gonna be a really uncomfortable conversation in a room full of white people, but if we don't have this conversation, you know, it can't be the responsibility of the black community to advocate for their own lives. It has to be our collective responsibility to advocate for fairness and for justice. And I remember it was like, it was uncomfortable. And I remember I had to answer the black on black thing and I was like, uh-uh. And, but it was so important that that conversation happened. So I know I'm going like, I'm going on and on, but like that, my, my, my commitment as, as a choral educator, because we have the power of text, is bringing the voices of people of color, of women, of programming more diversity, so that way th those voices enter the conversation because they, they've been left out for too long in so many arenas, including art. I'd like to throw in with this one as well. Um, yeah. It's, uh, with Ola's uh, mission, it's centered on three pillars, uh, advocacy, education, and arts. And uh, my background is theater. Um, and so I, the importance of art in, in, the, in, the, in the midst of all of chaos and crisis is so critical because that is the place where you're actually gonna have a dialogue, maybe a dialogue without words, a uh, dialogue of sound, a dialogue of movement, a dialogue of just, I can't, whatever it is, but art is critical. So um, we have a film festival, we're going to our 17th year, all Spanish language films with English subtitles that usually bring in a mix of Latino, non-Latino, Spanish speaking, English speaking uh, folks. Um, and we started something called the Ola Media Lab uh, because there's a filmmaker who kind of made herself available to, to me, to Ola. And I thought, well, this is great. And now we're, go we're in our second uh, school right now at Riverhead High School and basically teaching storytelling and filmmaking to the ENL uh, an ENL uh, class. About seven, uh, seven of the seven of the students have, have stuck with it um, because they can do it. Otherwise, the rest of the kids are going to work. And these are kids that are English as a new language. Is the, is their is what they're working through with, with high school. And they're different ages from like 13 to maybe 20. You could be up to 21 to be in, in, in high school. And um, teaching them the, the tools of this, of, of telling their stories or telling whatever story. And if that story ended up, and the, the, first the teacher who's Polish, her background is Polish, she said, well, it shouldn't this be called the social justice filmmaking? And I was like, no, we're not calling it social justice storytelling. Anything that's coming out of these kids' mouth is social justice, all right? They, I don't even know how they're walking the earth. I mean, they, a lot of them have traveled alone to be there. They've gone through ridiculous trials, and, and, and they're still going through them. Half of them wear a backpack to school because they don't know where they're going to sleep that night. Um, so, no, you, they tell their story, and whatever their story is is what their story is. And these kids were going through um, all kinds of different possibilities because at the end of the day, we we're going to show a film, potentially, or films, whatever they make. And then they decided, ultimately, that they wanted to tell their own immigration stories. This is not something that I came to the table thinking that would ever happen, nor did I necessarily want it to, but that's what they wanted to do. And they found it imperative to tell these stories. They're also talking about maybe doing uh, an exhibit and so we might link that we, we might have something that we link up with a local art institution, maybe in Southampton or close to where they are in Riverhead. Um, but really look at what are some of the key art centers of our community. And there are a lot of them because it, it happens to be the Hamptons. But I will say to you that if there's some work that you feel is exciting that's going on here, that even though you've got this campus as a community, you've also got what's nearby. You know, where, where's an art gallery where things are going on? Where, where's a theater locally that things are going on? And where can you take it off the campus? Campus. Where can you elevate it and, and show more light onto it um, with other l l art lovers that are going to understand the value and, uh, and the distinction of maybe a voice and, and art that you're seeing that might not be as celebrated here for whatever reason? Um, I would say look to the community around this campus as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. That'll have to be the last question. That was fast. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, please join me in th uh, thanking um, Ms. Perez, oh, uh, Ms. Levin, and Ms. Hirschwitz. That'll be all, and we're done. Hope to see you April 18th <laughs> at the, April 18th? the. It is a great yes, event. Yes, the diversity okay. summit. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. make sure you go there. <laughs>